The Federal Ministry of Health confirmed the first case of coronavirus disease, COVID-19, on the 27th of February, 2020, after the outbreak of the disease in China in January, 2020. The government of Nigeria, through the Federal Ministry of Health, strengthened measures to ensure that the outbreak in Nigeria is controlled and contained quickly, and a multi-sectoral coronavirus preparedness group led by the Nigeria Centre for Disease Control, NCDC, was immediately activated. And as at today, only 266,381 cases were confirmed, and sadly, recording 3,155 deaths in a pandemic that has so far claimed more than 6 million lives globally and resulted in the worst global recession since the Second World War. Interestingly, more than two years after the federal government instituted safety measures to contain the COVID-19 pandemic in the country, the President Muhammad Buhari administration approved the immediate relaxation of the safety measures and travel advisory following the recommendations of the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19, PSC. Secretary to the Government of the Federation and Chairman, Presidential Steering Committee, PSC on COVID-19, Mr. Boss Mustafa states that the decision is based on clinical and laboratory evidence of a sustained reduction in COVID-19 infection and transmission across the country, with over 60 million Nigerians fully vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus. So, our weekend file tonight, we focus on COVID-19 beyond restrictions. Amien Ray John and Dr. Mukhtar Mohammed, Technical Head, Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19, is our guest. Thank you for joining us. But first, the news. So we hit the road now as President Muhammad Buhari has made a case for more aggressive investment in Nigeria's profitable economy and existing and prospective investors, saying the country remains the best destination for return on investments. This was while addressing participants at the U.S. Nigeria Business Roundtable, an investment forum held on the margins of the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, D.C. State House correspondent Adam Usambo brings us details. The U.S. Nigeria Investment Forum, organized by the Corporate Council on Africa in conjunction with the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, brought together entrepreneurs and captains of industry to compare notes on the opportunities, challenges, as well as the nature and environment for doing business in Nigeria. Well, the time is now to scale up the level of U.S. and Nigerian investment. This forum today, Mr. President, presents an opportunity to build on your legacy. The world is watching which way Nigeria will move. President Muhammad Buhari described as welcoming the growing optimism by the international investor community about Nigeria's investment prospects and business potentials. We do not take your keen interest in the opportunities that exist in Nigeria for granted. In the most populous country and largest economy in Africa, there is no doubt that Nigeria remains Africa's largest single consumer market, projected to account for over 15% of overall growth in Africa's spending by 2025. The president who enumerated the various challenges inherited by his administration and the conscious as well as practical efforts made towards addressing them takes pride in the upward trajectory now being witnessed in every sector of Nigeria's economy. He said apart from enhanced provision of critical infrastructure, the economy is now more diversified and strengthened while tackling head-on the challenges of security. It is our strong belief that these determined efforts will rekindle interest to invest as well as enhance the volume of your investments in the Nigerian economy. Nigeria continues to treasure strong partnership with friends and allies in our national, continental, and global efforts for safety and survival.
the governors of Bauchi and Kwara states accompanied President Muhammad Buhari to the Business and Investment Dialogue. It has really been an eye-opener, uh, hugely beneficial, because it gave me, gave me the opportunity first to be close to the president, to appreciate his zeal, his energy, his penetration, his vision, and what he can do to really market Nigeria from the standpoint of his integrity and the people in, both in Nigeria and outside believe in him and respect him. And so we leverage on this also as, a, as governors that came with him to connect and discuss investment opportunities in our various subnational levels. We're speaking to investors and um, a lot of them are interested in coming to Nigeria to invest in lithium mining. Um, you have big companies um, that show interest in coming to Nigeria, um, the South Korean companies. So. Really, that's the drive we want, and that's the drive we're pushing. Both the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Nia Debayu, and the Executive Secretary, Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, Saratu Umar, reassured the audience of high returns on their investments as Nigeria is now more politically stable and ready for business. From Washington, D.C., Adamu Sambu, NTA News. Meanwhile, President Muad Buhari is reassuring Nigerians in the diaspora that the federal government will continue to do whatever it takes towards defending their interests, wherever they may be, without leaving anyone behind. The government, he however said, expects their willingness to give back their resources, talents, skills and global exposure in the development of the country. This was in Washington, D.C., while engaging with a cross-section of the Nigerian community in the United States. Again, State House correspondent Adam Musambu reports. The well-attended town hall meeting coincides with President Muhammad Buhari's 80th birthday and the nation's diaspora community in the United States could not help celebrating him. It was also an opportunity for participants, including those elected and appointed into positions of responsibility in the United States, to give their verdict on the president's stewardship in the last seven and a half years. Fundamentally, I want to say thank you for what you've been doing for our country. Now, funk all the way. And I thank you, sir, for all the service that you've done as you end your term to make Nigeria more prosperous and safer. And I believe we are entering what I am calling the African era. And Nigeria must lead yeah. the African era. We are not in office just to be in office. We are in office asking how can we help Nigeria. President Buhari is delighted with the honor and pride Nigerians in the United States bring to their fatherland but stress the absolute necessity for them to remain law-abiding and reference points of excellence. Let me reiterate that this would be my last address to our dear parents here in Washington. And let you know the high regards with which this administration has held you and to thank you immensely for keeping faith with Nigeria. Your faith in our country is not misplaced and will edit our momentum to turn Nigeria around appropriate leadership of our continent. The president noted that apart from diaspora home remittances through official channels hitting $20 billion last year, four times over the value of the nation's foreign direct investment, many of the diaspora compatriots are also investing actively in various sectors of Nigeria's economy. I must say, this is most commendable and in our enlightened collective self-interest as only Nigerians, those at home and abroad, can develop Nigeria. I am personally proud of you all. He used the forum to reaffirm his commitment towards ensuring that the 2023 election processes continue to progress smoothly transparently and consistent with the laws of the land. This is the only way we can strengthen democracy in Nigeria and set the right example for the rest of Africa 
can hopefully stop the recourse to unconstitutional changes of governments in our sub-region and the rest of African continent. Nigerian ambassador to the United States, Uzoma Emenike, had told the president that there are over one million documented Nigerians in the country, most of them law-abiding, intelligent, hardworking, and resilient. From Washington, D.C., Adam Usambu, NTA News. As still in Washington, President Maud Buhari says the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has no reason whatsoever not to conduct the 2023 elections as planned in line with the dictates of the Constitution and the Electoral Act. He said, having provided everything required by the Electoral Empire to properly execute its mandate, his administration is not prepared for any excuses. This was while responding to questions after his address to participants at the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington. Visiting the Institute for the second time since coming to power in 2015, President Muhammad Buhari is here to interface with the Washington community of global thought leaders and democracy advocacy groups on developments across the world, especially in developing nations that are grappling with the challenges of embedding democratic processes and systems. Attacks on democratic institutions, especially INEC offices in Nigeria, are part of those challenges raised at the forum as date for the next general elections in the country draws near. I think there were only two incidents. And don't forget we have uh, six geopolitical zones. And if two offices in one geopolitical zone were attacked, I think uh, in relative terms the security is good. So I don't want any excuse. Earlier in his address, the president told the gathering that a stage is now set for eligible Nigerians to return to the polls next year to exercise their franchise. And I am resolute in my determination to enable the conduct of free, fair and transparent national elections whose outcome would be largely accepted to the contestants. On security, global terrorism, banditry, and other transnational crimes posing enormous challenges to global peace and security, the president said rather than focus on negativity, which is what travel advisories have become, Nigeria, the sub-regions of Africa, and the rest of the world can work more concertedly together towards finding lasting solutions. The steward and stable Nigeria is indispensable for overall peace and prosperity of not only the country but Africa with huge implications for global peace and stability. He also touched on recent events in the global energy space saying Nigeria and other developing countries owe it to their people to create jobs and livelihoods which cannot be accomplished without maximizing their comparative advantage in energy for industrial growth. There can't be double standards where Western nations use their influence and weight to turn the types of global financing for fossil fuel transactions, which are much needed by developing nations. Yet when they feel the pinch, they are quick to turn on their coal-powered plants. President Buhari said, despite glooming outlook in the global economy and the ongoing war in Ukraine, Nigeria continues to register positive economic growth, especially in the last two quarters. At the interactive session include representatives of the National Democratic Institute, the International Republican Institute, the International Foundation for Electoral System, and the National Endowment for Democracy. From Washington, D.C., Adamu Sambu, NTA News. And away from official matters now, I'm sure you already know that today is President Muhammadu Buhari's birthday. And yes, he joins the League of Octogenarians amidst so much achievements and accolades. And here's a compilation of the successes of an extraordinary general who has made Nigeria enviable amongst Committee of Nations. Born on the 17th of December 1942 in Daura, Kazuna State, President Muhammadu Buhari was raised by his uncle, the then district head of Daura, Al-Haji Dauda Daura, 
father of Marlon Mamandora, who enlisted him for primary school. He attended the now government college Katsuna and was at the Nigerian Military Training College Kaduna, now known as the Nigerian Defense Academy, and attended many training military institutions that include the U.S. Army War College, Pennsylvania, and the National Defense College, New Delhi, in India. President Muhammad Buhari was outstanding in his military career in foreign peacekeeping and fought for Nigeria's civil war. As a politician, he has to his records improving infrastructural development such as the construction of the Second Niger Bridge, roads, rail, ports, power plants, airports, the national social investment programs to leave 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years, economic recovery, electoral reforms, winning the fight against insurgency, and sustaining the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. So deploying innovative financing mechanisms like the Presidential Infrastructural Development Fund, Executive Order 7, Suko Bounds, and Green Bonds are part of his achievements. He has recorded successes in police reforms and recognized globally for his contributions to national growth. Under his leadership, Nigeria presented Ambassador Mohamed Bandi, Nigeria's permanent representative, as the president of the UN General Assembly. Likewise, Amina Mohamed was appointed and reappointed as the deputy secretary general of the UN. He superheaded the campaign for the election of Dr. Ngozi Okonjaiwela as the World Trade Organization's director general, promoted the election and re election of Akin Adeshina for the second term in Africa's Development Bank. Recently, he commissioned the unveiling of the Kalmani oil well straddling Bauchi and Gombe State, promising more than a billion barrels of crude oil and over 500 billion cubic feet of natural gas. President Buhari is passionate about completing and inaugurating the Ajakuta steel rolling mill and construction of the 3,500 megawatts Mambila electricity power projects. As he attained the age of 80 in extraordinarily state of high physical and mental fitness, Muhammad Buhari's life continues to symbolize service to the nation and humanity as well as the education and commitment to the building of a secure, stronger, and prosperous Nigeria. And of course, congratulations are in order uh, to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Just as the All Progressives Congress APC felicitates with President Maud Buhari on the occasion of his 80th birthday. The party acknowledges that President Maud Buhari remains a source of great inspiration to many Nigerians as a model of discipline, integrity, resilience and patriotism and continues to offer visionary leadership to build a vibrant future for all Nigerians. Similarly, Vice President Himyo Shibajo and his wife Tolakwo Shibajo have congratulated President Maud Buhari on the occasion of his 80th birthday in a statement signed personally the Vice President says President Muhammad Buhari's extra extraordinary life of unblemished service to the nation in the army as a governor, minister, military head of state and as two-term civilian president demonstrates that it is possible to serve the nation and the people honestly, forthrightly and selflessly. In the same vein, the Inspector General of Police, Usman Akali Baba, first states with President Muhammad Buhari on the occasion of his 80th birthday celebration. The IGP notes that President Buhari's calculative approach to issues and remarkable and truly inspirational and have served as a guide and motivation to the force leadership while wishing Mr. President many more years and good health and happiness. The Inspector General of Police assures of the unwavering commitment of the force to the actualization of the police reform agenda and bequeathing to Nigerians good governance, safety and peaceful coexistence we all deserve in Nigeria. All right, this is Weekend File. Time for a break. Please stay. Our country want better. Our country want better. Go do one for us. Papa talk and move. Mama talk and move. For a better Nigeria. Good life and come. Now you we want to. Now you we need to.
people of Nigeria, they jolly for the better. We want Shelley for we country. So we need to put Ashiwa Jubala Tinubu as the next president of Nigeria. Our people don't look the matter well. Only Bala Tinubu don't do with it. Everybody can see. Now you get the experience. When you go fit, you stick like our country better. Make life sweet for we and our picking them. But Latinubu don't get a better plan to chase down war for we youth. Better school. The security of lives and property. Unity and peace of all we country people. People of Nigeria. But these and many other better things when in don't vocalize. It could make we all vote as Latinubu for president of Nigeria. Both Shetima as vice president. Both NPC. The party where she broom. Introducing an all-time mega offer. Get over 50% discount in the Airtel Home Broadband mega offer. Buy a router for just 10,000 Naira and get up to 240 gigabyte or a MiFi for 5,000 Naira and get up to 125 gigabyte bonus data. More data, more you. Reliable home broadband bar. Airtel, the smartphone network. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in collaboration with the National Broadcast Commission, NBC, Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, ICPC, Advertising Regulatory Council of Nigeria, ACON, and the Nigerian Police Force is hosting a stakeholders summit on political campaign financing and vote buying as we approach the 2023 general elections. Those invited to attend are the chairman of all political parties, candidates in the 2023 general elections, chief executive officers of broadcast stations and the press. The summit is scheduled to hold on Monday, 19th December 2022, venue. NAF Convent Center, Ahmed Dubeloway, Jabi Abuja. Time, 10 a.m. prompt. Speakers at the summit are Chairman, INEC, DG, NBC, Executive Chairman, EFCC, Chairman, ICPC, DG, Arkon, and the Inspector General of Police. Balarebe Shehu Ilela, Director General, National Broadcasting Commission, Announcer. The Emir of Gwandu and Chairman Kebe State Council of Chiefs, Dr. Muhammad Ilyas Ubasar, CFR MNI, heartily congratulates the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Muhammad Buhari, on the occasion of his 80th birthday. Mr. President, you have demonstrated unparalleled leadership skills, patriotism, integrity and courage in steering the ship of Nigeria since assuming office despite the global economic challenges. Wishing His Excellency more fruitful years. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has fixed Monday 12th December 2022 to Sunday 22nd January 2023 as the dates for the collection of PVCs nationwide from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. daily, including Saturdays and Sundays. All registrants who are yet to collect their PVCs or requested for transfer of registration, as well as those who applied for replacement of lost or damaged PVCs, can now visit INEC local government offices where they intend to vote to collect their PVCs. Collection of PVCs PVCs will be further extended to ward level for those who are unable to collect theirs at local government offices from Friday 6th to Sunday 15th January 2023. Thereafter, the exercise will be reverted to the local government offices of the INEC until Sunday 22nd January 2023. Remember, only those with PVC can vote on election day. Collect your PVC now to vote. It is your duty. This message is brought to you by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. And supported by the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Welcome back. The People's Democratic Party PDP presidential candidate in the 2023 election, Alahaji Atiko Bubakar, says if elected, his administration will address insecurity in the Southeast. Atiko Bubakar was speaking at the PDP presidential rally in Oberi. Chupike Chuku has the details. The People's Democratic Party presidential campaign train arrived the state in continuation of its rally across the country. PDP presidential candidate Alhaji Atiku Abubakar assured the people that if elected, he will prefer solution to security challenges facing the state, as Nigeria will be great again. I want to assure you that if I have the opportunity and you elect me, Business, trading, we pick up again. I'm going to set aside 10 billion US dollars just to empower women and young men in business. National Chairman of the Party, Yochi Ayu, 
in his remarks to call on Imo people to vote massively for candidates of the party. No other choice. We can no have a choice. Whoever is telling you any other thing is making a mistake. Imo is PDP. And by God's grace, we did it in 2019. In 2023, we are going to double what we did last time. The event attracted People's Democratic Party chieftains from within and outside the state. In Oweri, Chuku Bike Chuku, NTA News. A still talking politics, presidential candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party, Rabiu Musa Kwankoso, says his candidature provides better option with clear cut vision for national development and stressed the need for Nigerians to trust him with their votes. He said this while inaugurating the party structure in Southern Kaduna Senatorial Zone. Haruna Mohammed reports. In company of the party's governorship candidate in Kaduna State, Senator Suleiman Utmun Hukui and party faithfuls, Senator Rabi Musa Konkoso stormed Southern Kaduna to interact with his supporters. While inaugurating the party structure in the area, the NMPP presidential candidate said the party is poised to redeem the country from socio-economic decay. He urged people in Southern Kaduna to vote the party in all elections as the shortest way to prosperity. Governorship candidate Suleiman Utman Hukui said NMPP remains party to beat in Kaduna State. He urged party supporters not to relent in their quest to wrestle power from the ruling party. Other speakers pledged to mobilize support for the party in all elections. <laughs> While speaking to NTA News, Senator Rabiu Musa Konkoso sum up his visit to Saran Kaduna this way. So happy with the traditional rulers, we are so happy with the politicians, and more importantly the masses that we represent came out a mass in all the places we visited, both Muslims and the Christians. The party in Kaduna State hosted its presidential candidate to a two-day engagement. While at Saran Kaduna, the presidential candidate and his entourage paid homage to some traditional leaders in the zone. Haruna Mohammed, NTA News. Now talking security, the 271 Nigerian Air Force NAF Detachment Burini Gwari Kaduna State has carried out a rescue operation in the early hours of 17th December 2022, leading to the rescue of seven Chinese expatriates earlier kidnapped and held hostage by terrorists. In a statement signed by NAF Director of Public Relations and Information, Eric Commodore Edward, Gapwet. The rescued Chinese victims are believed to have been kidnapped in June 2022 by terrorists while working on a mining site in Ajata Aboki, Gurmana Wood of Shiroro local government area of Niger State. The combat search and rescue operation, which consisted of 35 special forces, was conducted in the cover of night at uh, Kamfani, Doka and Guasca general areas, leading to the terrorists abandoning their enclave with weapons and the Chinese hostages, who have since been flown to a NAF medical center for medical attention. The chief of the air staff, Air Marshal Oladayo Amao, hails the rescue effort of the special forces and reiterates the NAF's commitment to protecting the territorial integrity of the nation. In other news, in an attempt to bridge the unplayability skill gap among Nigerian youths, a non-government organization, Knowledge Exchange Center, has in the last couple of years been impacting practicable skills and training on university and polytechnic graduates with a view to mitigating the rate of unemployment in the country. Chairman, Knowledge Exchange Center, Charles Mwodo, said the initiative is also targeted at addressing underemployment among participants. But Abola de Salami reports. At numerous efforts by the federal government through a series of programs and policies targeted at addressing unemployment among the youth, the rate remains a source of concern. To scale down the number, Knowledge Exchange Center introduced three major intervention channels, which are GAP Network, in-house employability training programs, and an advocacy program where stakeholders are engaged to discuss criteria and set skills for job seekers. Since we started in 2014, every single one of our graduates has either started gone ahead to start their own business or get multiple job uh, employment offers. So it, it, it tells us from uh, verifiable 
you know, set of statistics that the program is working. Identified as a meeting point where fresh graduates discover their potential and realize dream goals, College Exchange Center has produced a number of employable graduates and job creators. I would like them to always believe in this country and pursue excellence in whatever they are doing, whether they are at work or they're setting up a business of their own. Pursue it with integrity and single-minded focus on achieving success. Participants who had undertaken a series of trainings and capacity building sessions expressed their feelings. In the digital marketing, um, I, I'm better now because uh, after the training, I was able to implement a lot that I, I got from the training. So far, I have been able to gain some um, skills that I hope to put into use in future. Skills like um, copywriting. With this training, the sixth since it was established, Management of Knowledge Exchange Center says the center is living up to its mandate of changing the employment index narrative of the country. In Lagos, Abola de Salami, NTNU. Time for another break. Please stay with us. My people, my name is Emeka. Let me get all these people. I don't learn my lesson. Somebody come buy motor for my hand, carry big, big money, come give me. Now, when we get bust, then my eye open. Now, no, no, see that 419 EB. Now, when EFCC, bam, bam, then they come bab me too. Now, he make me, they warn you. All of them, I want to do business like me. When they carry big, big money, well, I go, sometimes I go carry transfer, carry bring back. They could not shine in my eye because <laughs> the special control unit against money laundering, what they call SCUMO, they don't want to say if the money pass 5 million naira for individual, no <laughs> collect them. If you pass 10 million naira for company, no collect them. Can I go where? Bank. If you not do them like that, 250,000 naira for every day where this offense happen. <laughs> or they go suspend your license or they go cuckoo. Shut them down. Matter, matter, for your hand. No talk say I no one you. This message is from the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. Three pieces. Please listen. Please, I don't want to talk. Should we just give me one chance? <laughs> Uh, now prepare the food where I shop now. Ah, it's different. <laughs> sure you go make them for me tomorrow again. No, 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 no. Now you go to prepare my food from now on. Eh? <laughs> hmm. Mr. Chef's spices cube, they are available for different, different pack sizes. Try them today. It's different. Fighting here and there. We don't want it at all. Killing people today, tomorrow. We don't want it at all. And we don't want separation. You do your own, I do my own. Make you go. Michael, I, no, 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 no. We don't want that one. We may quarrel and disagree, but let it be on the table of dialogue. No blood, kills, war, violence. Let us stand with our nation as one people. And we must also stand for the armed forces. They are our husbands and wives. They are our brothers and sisters. Please support the armed forces whose lives are always on the front line to protect our nation. Nigeria is your own. Nigeria is mine. Nigeria is our own. Our uniqueness is in our oneness. Our oneness is our strength. This is Aredo. We're sorry to inform you. My husband was found dead this morning. It's possible that he was stabbed while he slept. So what do we know about this so-called senior court member? Welcome back. The health sector in Nigeria since 2020 has been characterized by efforts uh, to tackling the coronavirus pandemic, which impacted negatively on the world's economy and leaving the health sector with devastating consequences. Health correspondent Uchio Kuchuku takes a look at Nigeria's multi-sectoral response to addressing this health crisis, which recently resulted in lifting of imposed restrictions. <laughs> There were weeks and months of near empty streets and businesses on the lock and key in major cities across the country. 
These were aspects of the narrative of the threat and impacts of COVID-19 infections in Nigeria and the country's reaction following the incursion of COVID-19 into its shores in February 2020. Compliance is one of the keys. This was the government's first step. A presidential task force, now Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19, kept Nigerians abreast of public management strategies designed to monitor and evaluate the crisis with daily briefings on casualty figures, safety protocol and advisories to ensure Nigerians stay safe. After every meeting, we would meet with the governor, the subgroup of the governor, define a path of action and make sure that we had synchrony between the Nigerian, the national response at the federal level and the, uh, at the state level across the country. Because of our resilience, because of our ability to innovate, uh, we're able to respond to these public health challenges. While mitigating measures subsisted, the country also kick-started some actions specifically targeting curative medicine. The Central Bank of Nigeria also offered grants to fund health-related researches in new and improved drugs, vaccines and diagnostics of infectious diseases. This is in addition to the waiver on all imported medical equipment and supplies, which commenced from May 1, 2020. We have expanded our laboratory capacity from just a couple of uh, public health laboratories to well over 140. We have also built molecular laboratories in every institution. In the midst of concerns over rising cases of COVID-19 came the cherry news of the successful production of effective, efficient and safe vaccines against the disease. Rollouts of first, second and booster doses continued till date. With these concerted efforts for almost three years, Nigeria gradually stepped out of the COVID-19 pandemic. This brought about President Mohamed Buhari's recent approval of the immediate relaxation of COVID-19 safety measures and travel advisories following the recommendations of the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19. Uche Ugochuku, NTA News. Well, thanks, Uche, for that uh, background report. Uh, now, COVID-19 pandemic made the world appreciate scientists who left nothing to chance to ensure that the monster becomes a thing of the past. Nigeria was not left out as the federal government and scientists engaged in series of collaborations targeted at ensuring homegrown solutions. Annie Daniels in this next report uh, tells us that success has already been recorded as uh, proven by available inventions. Let's see it. The advent of COVID-19 no doubt took the world by surprise, affecting institutions and livelihoods. Lagos State recorded the first case of COVID-19 in Nigeria, thereby putting the state in the eyes of the storm. The state government left nothing to chance at ensuring that the virus did not go out of hands. The federal government has done extremely well by providing this to, to, to Nigerians. I must also commend Lagos State and their local government Health facilities are really well established. Two years down the line, the safety measures put in place to checkmate spread of the virus have been relaxed. This is a cherry news for Lagosians and for experts in the health and technology sectors. The government and concerned authorities haven't gone to sleep. The gene editing is a technology that is uh, going deeper to be precise, to get to the root of a problem and uh, solve that problem. Most of the things we buy from overseas, they, they come here to take it, research on that and send back to us. Moving forward, we have to research our own product. Nigeria is making adequate preparation to ensure that uh, future occurrences are properly contained. COVID-19 vaccines are available at different designated centers and they are still free till today. Meanwhile, Nigerians are advised to not ignore instructions by the government and health experts in their desire to have a healthy society. In Lagos, Annie Daniels, NTA News. Well, thanks, Annie, uh, for that report. And joining me now in the studio to talk more on uh, COVID-19 beyond restrictions is uh, Dr. Mukhtar Mohammed. He's the technical head, Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good to have me. All right. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic <coughs> held the world down. And of course, many people thought that Africa would be worst hit. What do you think were the measures that uh, made it uh, not that bad for Africa. And let's be specific now, talking about Nigeria. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening, Nigerians. Um, 
Let me join other well-meaning Nigerians uh, to on behalf of our committee wish our president um, you know a happy 80th uh, birthday. Uh, to remind you that President Muhammad Buhari is also the uh, African champion of COVID-19. Um, so we wish him a very happy uh, birthday. So um, back to your question, um, what are the factors that probably um, make uh, COVID-19 not to be uh, as much serious you know, in Africa as we've seen it in, in other parts of the world? Um, well, for certain, we do not know exactly what are these factors. Um, but looking at um, some of the empirical evidence, we'll say that number one, um, our climate probably contributed um, to that because COVID-19, like other uh, respiratory illnesses, you know, commonly spreads uh, during the cold uh, season. And if you look at the pattern of our own uh, waves and patterns, it also occurred, um, you know, during mostly during November uh, to January. Um, secondly, because of, you know, our culture or maybe our uh, social, um, you know, system, which allows us to, um, you know, have an open space. Our markets are open. Our transportation system is mostly, uh, you know, in vehicles. Um, you don't have many people uh, using the, the train or the tubes where infections can rapidly uh, spread. spread okay um, and lastly maybe the even the effect of temperature uh, because being tropical region um, you know the temperatures are, uh, are higher and perhaps these are the reasons um, uh, we think probably you know that may have m made the spread of COVID-19 uh, to not be as much as we see in the temperate climate. All right, Dr. Muhammad, from what you're saying, you're not sure of the factors that, you know, made uh, the COVID-19 virus not so serious mm -hmm. in Nigeria uh, specifically. Uh, so since you're not sure of uh, why we didn't have it that bad in the past, do you think this is the right time to actually relax measures, considering the fact that some other parts of the world are still contending with the virus? So, um, you know, in science, um, normally we do not uh, say we are sure until we have um, empirical evidence and we have the facts you know uh, and data um, that has uh, suggested but talking about relaxation yes we have evidence that um, guide us you know to uh, make the pronouncement or relaxation um, and these are evidence that we have documented over time we have monitored over time um, and now we can conclusively say that yes COVID-19 is still around but it does not uh, portend uh, so much danger that it will allow uh, you know the continued uh, restriction uh, in public spaces. If you say there should be no continued restriction in public spaces, why is the travel documents uh, still uh, being filled by those traveling into the country? Uh, because uh, we hear that uh, there's a travel certificate, everyone traveling into Nigeria is expected to fill even when they are fully vaccinated. There's no way in the world that is happening at the moment. So why is Nigeria doing that? So let's let's take it uh, step by step. Um, number one, this is a relaxation of restrictions. That is what was announced last week uh, based on the approval provided by Mr. President. And the relaxation includes several components. Number one, uh, it allows for um, uh, it removes the restriction on number of people, you know, per limited spaces. Uh, it removes testing uh, for people who are coming into Nigeria. Mind you, there are still about uh, 60 plus countries that require you to do uh, COVID-19 testing before you travel uh, to those countries. Now, talking about the, the health questionnaire or the health declaration form, that is something that has been there even before covid so what we did now is we also modified the form to return it back to pre-COVID era. And it is non-specific in the sense that it can help us to track other diseases as, to, as well, not just uh, COVID-19. Mind you, in Africa uh, right now, we are still under the threat of, of Ebola because Ebola is um, endemic in Uganda um, and we have other diseases like Marburg that recently, you know, uh, affecting our neighbors uh, in Ghana. So these are uh, dangerous infectious diseases that we need to prevent from coming 
uh, into our country. And it's mostly, you know, human to human transmission um, that occurs. So the health questionnaire or that health declaration form helps to document that the person who is boarding that plane or coming by whatever means into Nigeria has declared that he does not have fever, um, he does not have uh, uh, symptoms, he does not have uh, uh, sneezing or cough, and these are the initial symptoms usually, or he doesn't have bleeding from the nose and ear as in Ebola, because if you have that and you board on a plane with other people, you are likely to uh, contaminate and, and infect them. So that health form is a self-declaration that passengers make to say that we do not have these symptoms and we have your name, your address, your telephone number so that if there is need to contact to you to and isolate you immediately, mm. that can be uh, arranged and, and, and done quickly. Okay, I think that is uh, quite understood. Uh, you know, when we talk about COVID-19, it's clear, you know, that uh, it changed our lives and the way uh, we do things and it has also revealed the lapses that we have in our country, especially in the health sector sector. Uh, for you, as a member of the Presidential Steering Committee, seeing, you know, from the beginning to, let me say, the end mm -hmm. of COVID-19 in Nigeria, what do you think are the lessons learned and uh, what's the way forward now? Uh, there are a lot of lessons um, that we have learned and that are still there for, for us to learn and to also build on uh, those lessons. Um, number one uh, lesson is that we need to stay in constant state of preparedness. Uh, when COVID hit us, uh, there are things that um, were quite basic, uh, but were not uh, commonly found. Talking about gloves, face masks, hand sanitizers were not common, uh, you know, to find um, in the country. Secondly, um, uh, we did not even have um, enough, um, you know, uh, stockpile of materials that the health workers need you know, to provide their services in the facilities. We're talking about the protective gears um, and personal protective equipment. Third, our people have not been trained adequately in terms of uh, dealing with such, um, you know, very uh, ferocious, you know, infectious diseases. And such trainings, you know, have been conducted and they co they've continued to be um, conducted. Local manufacturing, you know, that is very key. Um, nobody, this is the first time, at least in our own uh, lifetime, where the whole world kind of closed down. There were no movement of people, no movement of, of commodities, um, etc. And therefore, uh, when China closed down, it was difficult to import, you know, most of the medicines, most of the uh, equipment, most of the, uh, you know, consumables that you require usually for your health service. So uh, self-sustenance and local production of these materials is very critical. Then the vaccine uh, issue, we saw how the vaccine politics also, uh, because out, we yeah. have relied for several years, you know, on a direct, uh, uh, you know, a channel of uh, sending vaccines, you know, from one part of the world to the other. In the entire African continent, you know, there was no single vaccine production uh, so of course this would uh, you so know these are huge lessons that have do more and, and uh, more. get get into production and uh, you know do the needful for ourselves uh, beautiful so uh, because of time what will be your last words Nigeria since we're putting COVID behind us now well um, <laughs> that is we have to be a little careful yes um, we want to put COVID behind us but for Nigerians to know that yes, COVID is still around and we need relaxation of these restrictions does not mean that people should not uh, practice them where necessary. It is still recommended when you get into uh, crowded places to wear your face mask. If you are having cold, you are coughing or you are sneezing, it's good also you wear your face mask so that you protect um, other people. Um, and of course, vaccination continues. Absolutely. Absolutely, we take our back. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Mukhtar Mohammed, uh, Technical Head, Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19. Thank you for your insights on that weekend file tonight. Thank you for having me. And uh, of course, I'm sure the, this uh, committee will be dissolved in no time. We hope so, as <laughs> soon as uh, we submit our reports to Mr. President. All right, thank you very much. And we hope we do not have any other ch health uh, challenge like we did with COVID. Okay, so we'll take a break now on uh, weekend file. When we come back, we'll talk sports. This day.
They swore an oath to serve our fatherland and defend the people. They traded their freedom, comfortable homes, and mortgaged their lives on the battleground for our unity and peaceful living. These are the great, fearless, loyal, and committed Nigerian armed forces who risked their lives courageously to safeguard our borders. But in the line of duty, many never returned. Nigerians, arise, let's celebrate our fallen heroes. Put on the remembrance emblem of pride to support the incapacitated and families of our fallen heroes. The occasion gives cause for reflection and reminds us of the sacrifice made by our armed forces in preserving the unity of the country. All ministries, parastatals, religious and corporate bodies to donate generously to the Emblem Appeal Launch. Send your donations to this account. Account name, Emblem Appeal Launch. Account number 393 2007526 Echo Bank Nigeria PLC All right let's uh, have our sports news now for the first time in 118 years of FIFA existence, an African team has made it into the semi-finals of the Senior Men's World Cup in Qatar. Despite losing 2-1 to Croatia in the third place match in Qatar, analysts believe Morocco has done very well. Being able to play the top place match is something that every African should be proud of. What it simply translates to is that Morocco has played the maximum number of matches that any country uh, has played or will play uh, in the history of the World Cup as far as this format is concerned. And so they have done very well and the result against Croatia you know, takes nothing away from what they have achieved in this World Cup. France, as the defending champions, are looking forward to making history by defending the title they won in Russia in 2018. If France is able to win the tournament, it will be the first time any country will do that in 50 years. Over 800 civil servants drawn from over 40 ministries, agencies and press startups are participating in the 2022 edition of the Federation of Public Service Games holding in Joss, Plateau State. Declaring the week-long event open, the Commissioner for Youth and Sports and the National National President of the Federation, both implore participants to compete clean and in the spirit of sportsmanship. The spirit of Plateau is one that never says no to people whenever they come. We may not give you everything you want, but we'll make sure we don't leave you empty-handed. The population is here, the assets are here, the resources are there. So we can actually harmonize and also harness the resources. NTA is making its third appearance in the game that will see the public servants compete in over 15 sporting events with Sports Update and El Jadiku NTA. The World Cup may be drawing to an end, but we track back and take a look at the journey uh, of this year's finalists and their bid for World Cup glory. Daniel Adeniri will walk us through. If words could describe the Qatar 2022 World Cup thus far, it would be the upsets by the underdogs. From history-making goals to mesmerizing show of skill and breathtaking saves, the Qatar 2022 World Cup has seen it all. But even as the curtains come down on what has been a month long of intriguing and scintillating moments, we take a look at the journey of the two teams who are vying for ultimate glory. On one hand, France came into the tournament as defending champions and favourites to win. On the other, Argentina were the underdogs no one actually saw going all the way, even though they had a Lionel Messi who came into this competition having won 35 straight games with the Alpa Celeste, including the Copa America and Finalissima. However, a clog in the wheel of their progress came in the form of Saudi Arabia, who laid the foundation for several other upsets to follow when they defeated Argentina 2-1 in their first group game. The Le Bleu, on the other hand, flew out of their blocks with two straight victories to book their place in the knockout stages. They however also tasted defeat at the hands of Tunisia, who produced a clinic slash masterclass on how speed star Kylian Mbappe could be stopped. England would later use the excerpts from that match and indeed kept the speed star quiet, but it wasn't enough to see them through to the semi-final. Lionel Messi and Argentina were on the other side of town, proving critics and naysayers wrong with wins over rivals Mexico and Poland. Then came the knockout stages, and a 35-year-old Messi turned back the hands of time and produced arguably one of the best performances against Australia. 
And just when many had thought the Orania of Netherlands would outwit the South Americans, chained tight as the backline of the Dutch were, Lagenel Matador face to face with a fearsome bull. Messi pierced through and supplied one of the best assists of the tournament thus far. Up until this point, France had a smooth run with Olivier Giroud becoming France's all-time top goal scorer and Mbappe becoming the youngest after Pelé to score three plus goals in two successive World Cups. But the Atlas Lions of Morocco proved their toughest opponents yet in the semi-final and came so close but yet so far to alting the French to a standstill. But it was not to be. Croatia were however looking to proceed to what would have been their second final in a row, but fell short to the magic of Lionel Messi and Julien Alvarez to set up a penultimate final with the French. Both Lionel Messi and Kylian Mbappe are in contention for the Golden Boot Award with five goals each. Messi, however, has one assist more than Mbappe as it stands. Only two teams defeated the Alba Celeste at the Russia 2018 World Cup, Croatia and France. And while they successfully saw one out, one last hurdle stands between them and glory. And over 45 million Argentinians will be looking to one man to deliver this much elusive glory into their hands. For one, it is the last dance, while for the other, it is the start of what might be a great legacy. Indeed, football is interesting. Who would they be? Argentina or France? Keep your fingers crossed. One of the leading Nigerian historians and Vice Chancellor Gombe State University of Science and Technology, Professor Abdullahi, is dead. He was buried today. Abu Bakar Adamu reports. It was indeed a sad moment for many in Gombe State who joined sympathizers to pay their last respect to the man who contributed immensely to the development of a specially tertiary education in the state. Professor Abdullah Himadi, a historian and environmentalist, became a household name in Gombe State, having set up one of the best state universities around and another state university of science and technology, Kumu. Also noticeable was his passion for preserving the natural environment and his support for the physically challenged. Today we are witnessing a great loss, the fall of an academic colossus. He never segregated base or religion or tribe, never. He has never at all. And that has touched me and he has influenced my own perception of life. The one-time Vice-Chancellor Ahmed Bele University Zaria and Director Ariel House Kaduna, Professor Mahdi died at the age of 75, leaving behind one wife and seven children, bequeathing an enviable legacy in the academic and non-academic cycles. In Gumbi, Abu Bakr Adamu, MTA News. And that concludes Weekend File tonight. Many thanks for watching. Be a star. Stand against rape and rapists. Good night. Thank you.